That is exactly what I'm going to talk about. I'm from Northwestern. Um, my disclosures, hopefully not particularly relevant, but there are a few of them related to implants up there. Uh, so when we talk about adult deformity, I'm really talking about scoliosis, uh, which can be a degenerative scoliosis, which we see commonly in an aging population. It can be uh, adult idiopathic scoliosis, so a, a curvature that existed when they were younger that's now progressing in adulthood, and it looks different, and it, it behaves a little different than a true degenerative curvature. A lot of rotation, so you have to factor that in. Uh, iatrogenic curves, direct above an old fusion, we see more and more of that with degenerative conditions becoming deforming ones. Uh, kyphosis and then sagittal imbalance, which includes sort of a flat back deformity, which oftentimes is an iatrogenic uh, issue as well. When we talk about spinal deformity, we often lump spondylolisthesis in there. Uh, in kids, that's a real deformity because usually it's an isthmic spondy. In adults, most spondy is degen. You can certainly see that, but it's a smaller part, and it's not really what we're, we're going to talk too much about today. So when we talk about steps to correct a deformity, i got a whole list of things here. And all of this stuff matters. It really is a, is a part of this. So um, figuring out what your deformity is, so getting a long cassette x-ray, so whether that's a 36-inch x-ray or now we get EOS films on everybody, which is even better. Um, getting dynamic films, so assessing what they look like, not only standing up but lying down, bending to the side. There's prone, push prone, traction, many different things you can do to try and assess what you're dealing with from a deformity standpoint. And then you have to decide, is it symptomatic? I see a lot of scoliosis in my practice. I don't operate on most of it. People come in, they've got a curve, it's balanced, they're functioning pretty well. Surgery is worse than what they're doing. Like the people see curves and they start talking about surgery, but people forget that the stiffness from a scoliosis operation is life changing and you can never take it back. And it's not normal. You are never giving them a normal spine. So you can make x rays look great and be proud of them, but if they're not going to function better at the end, you didn't do them any favors. So you have to decide. Is it symptomatic and has it failed appropriate non-surgical modalities? And, and there's a lot of that. If you want to do a lot of adult deformity, you're going to see a lot of patients that you are managing non-surgically before you get to those surgical patients. Um, assessing their balance. So balance is all the key, all the things you hear about now. You know, pelvic instance, pelvic tilt, that's become sort of commonplace uh, in all training programs now, at least it should be. Um, fusion levels, that's a tricky, tricky thing. How much are you going to fuse? How much motion are you taking? Where can you save a level? Where can you not? Uh, and then figuring out what you're going to do for that patient. Figuring out what that patient is. Are they a 70-year-old, tiny little lady with osteoporosis? That's a very different patient than, than an obese, uh, significantly kyphotic patient or a patient with Parkinson's disease. They all are very different substrates. You have to figure out what, what that that person needs to, to do well. Um, then intraoperatively, a bunch of steps there too. So getting positioning is, is really a key. So getting them on the table as positioned as well as possible is sometimes half the battle. And you have to pay attention that you're doing it right. Not only are you getting them positioned appropriately, but you're padding things like all their nerves really well because you're going to have them in that position for a while. Um, achieving appropriate fixation sounds easy. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, then releasing the spine, so various osteotomies, soft tissue releases, uh, whatever you're you're doing for that, and then actually correcting the deformity, so putting the rod and applying forces to the, the implants you've put in, and then obviously you need to get fusion at the end. So we talk about identifying deformity, so uh, fairly straightforward stuff here. Uh, coronal plane, so if you look at an x-ray from in the from the frontal view, uh, coronal plane, there's a couple things that matter. One is the um, center sacral vertical line and a C7 plumb line. Obviously, this is a balanced spine. This is an unbalanced spine, so a, a, what we call a coronal balance or a trunk shift. Uh, and you can see that when the person walks in, walks in your office. You want those two lines to line up. Somebody that's lined up in the coronal plane can have a lot of scoliosis and be totally asymptomatic. And you're going to measure cob angles, and I always tell everyone it's the top of the top to the bottom of the bottom. Resist the urge to sort of deviate from that, that structure. Uh, there's the cob angle more graphically. Uh, if you look at it, you're going to take the, you want the biggest measurement you can get. That's the true representation of that curve. So you want the most angled in on each end. And, and if you're doing it on a PAX, it's really easy because you can draw one and I actually take that line. I drag it up to the one below, above or below to make sure I'm really at the one that's most angled. Uh, this is showing you, it says this wide. That's the disc. is It's wider on the convexity of the curvature. And there's never one curve, right? There's always a curve above and below the main curve. Uh, they can be structural. They can be compensatory. But you don't want to measure that because you'll 
you'll reduce that. And when you dictate a clinic note, so if you're seeing a patient for scoliosis, I always say uh, they're, you know, T5 to T10 curve was this. So I know which, which levels I measured in the, in the past and what that was, so I can follow that going forward. Uh, so when we talk about their balance, this is the that C7 plumb line versus the center sacral vertical line. If they line up, they're in balance. If they don't, they aren't. Uh, that's a key one. This is the tricky one for surgery. If you take the person that's in balance and put them through a scoliosis operation, you run a very real risk of taking them out of coronal balance. Luckily, that's pretty well tolerated for the most part, as long as it's subtle. But if you take somebody that's balanced and you give them a trunk shift, they are going to be unhappy, even if they have no pain, because they will look different. So, so you have to pay attention to that. And that's the hardest thing to actually judge in surgeries. Do you have them lined up in the, in the coronal plane? Uh, sagittal alignment, this is sort of basics of thoracic, right? Your normal thoracic kyphosis, your thoracolumbar junction should be relatively neutral and you're, you should have lumbar lordosis. How much lumbar lordosis is sort of the, the whole pelvic incidence and everything else that we've been talking about uh, over the last decade. So an SVA, this is the original, are you balanced? It's sort of a, the centroid of the C7 vertebral body measured to the posterior superior aspect of the, the sacrum. It is still a useful measure. It is still kind of the workhorse of a quick look. Hey, is this person aligned or not aligned? And you can see that, that really well. To do this though, you have to have a standing long cassette x-ray and they have to be standing up well. They can't be leaning on a, on a uh, pole or hanging on to something or using a walker. They have to be standing in their own posture. Uh, and if you can't see the, the, the sacrum and pelvis, you have a hard time measuring compensation. So when I was doing my fellowship year, I would have to go down with patients. Oftentimes if they took a bad x-ray, I'd have to go down and make sure they stood up without a compensated posture. That was before we routinely measured pelvic tilt where you can just angularly measure that now to see how much they're compensating. So that saves our current people lots of trips. Um, so when we look at the pelvic incidence, that's what this is. I, I don't want to belabor these too much, but they're always important when we're talking about alignment. That is simply you draw a line on the end plate of S1 a perpendicular to that line is here measured to the centroid of the two femoral heads. So if, if on your x-rays, your femoral heads overlap, great, makes it easy. If they don't, you draw a line from midpoint to midpoint and you take the midpoint of that line uh, and you do this. And the reason that this doesn't change is because it's measured just to the patient. Whether this patient's laying down, standing up, upside down, it doesn't matter, right? These angles are measured to points on their body. So it never changes. Uh, these are the two components that make that up, pelvic tilt and sacral slope. If you think about this, the, so pelvic tilt is that same line to the femoral heads, just to a vertical. Anytime you start measuring from the, a line of the patient to something in the outside world, vertical, horizontal, whatever you're doing, now as that person moves in space, that number changes. So that's why you see pelvic tilt change when people retrovert or rotate their pelvis because it's measured to a point outside of them, uh, to a point that's inside of them. And as they move in space, that, that moves. So that's how you can tell compensation. So. Newer things, we published this many years ago now, uh, talking about cranial center of mass. So as a neurosurgeon doing deformity, I always tell people I don't really live in my C7, I think I live up here. Um, and I wanna measure from, that's where you're, when somebody's standing in space, they're positioning their head over the pelvis. They're not, they don't care where their C7 is, they're positioning their head in space. And so you can do that measurement as well. It's actually a nice measurement to see the, you know, sort of my fudge factors. I kind of want that line in the front of the sacrum. That's a pretty good, in front of the sacrum behind the femoral heads is usually a nice zone for people to live in. I think you get less junctional issues if you do that. Uh, that's simply measured if you draw a line from the nasion to the inion on, a, on an x-ray, the midpoint of that line is the, is the center mass of the head and you can measure from that pretty easily. So you can see a correction there. That's, this guy's had a lot of work done to get him back to that point, but that's falling right where I'd want that to be. It's kind of a blurry x-ray, but front of the sacrum's here, femoral heads are here, so he's in, in between there. I, I like that position. So what else is coming? T1 pelvic angle, there are all kinds of people looking at differing measurements that can be utilized. A T1 pelvic angle is essentially an angular measurement, so it's not measured to, to the outside world. You don't have to measure a number, right? So if I measure a C7 plumb line, I draw it down, and I'm measuring how many millimeters in front of the sacrum that person is. Uh, if your x-ray isn't calibrated, your measurement's wrong, right? So you have to have a calibrated x-ray, you have to stand at exactly you know, six feet from the film and all those, those sorts of things. Um, and comparing institution to institution, you have to you know, make sure that things are accurate and calibrated. This is an angular measurement, so it essentially takes the pelvic tilt and this SVA into one measurement, uh, and you can see that there. Do I use it now? No, not because it's not good, just because 
it's a lot of measurements already and I kind of have my my thing down um, if this could simplify it I could see this this picking up steam as we go though just to understand what we're talking about so uh, next step is we're assessing the flexibility so we're looking at what is the deformity now we're trying to assess what that flexibility is so there's lots of different ways you can do that uh, you got to get a standing x-ray to assess the deformity then supine is the most important to me so just laying them down and sometimes you get a ct scan as a part of your workup or an mri every time somebody comes in with an mr i'm always looking if they had the little scout views or a little coronal i'm looking to see how much that changed on that that view is a little cheater uh cts are great you see vacuum discs i always tell everybody if i see a vacuum disc on a ct i guarantee you i can get that to move where i want it to go um but supine, supine side bending. So when we talk about side bending films, those aren't standing up x-rays, people leaning over, that's laying down, bending to the side. Uh, push prone is exactly that. Traction films, uh, again, push prone and traction need somebody to go down and actually do those films. So so if you need them, you need them, but it's not an everyday event, at least in, in my institution. And, and CT is really good. So if somebody gets a CT scan and I can get a good idea of the flexibility there, um, I tend to not get a, the rest of these these films because I, I tend to not, not need them because I can assess that on there. For an adult degenerative scoliosis, usually the CT is really nice. Um, here's a patient. So if you look at this film here, uh, that projects pretty well. There is a grade four spondy here. This is a patient that had surgery, implants started to loosen. So what's the answer when implants loosen? I'll tell you, it's not just take them out because this is what happens. So if it starts to fail, just taking the screws out, yes, you're not going to get loosening anymore, but the person's not going to be better. Um, so, right, your problem is shifted to their problem, but that's not really nice. Um, but that's pretty impressive. If that's stuck like that, that is a really difficult case. Uh, but I had a CT scan, and look at this. This is a grade two slip on this CT scan. I didn't have to do much at all on that kind of, right? So I, I know it's mobile. If it's mobile, now I have to just get fixation and, and start, you know, releasing the bone a little more, and protecting the nerves and getting back to a line. But if you look at that, um, all right, I... This lady thinks I'm a hero. Like she, she loves me. She was really miserable, and she is super happy. And it wasn't that hard. Uh, this lady has a pretty significant deformity. If you look here, I'm always looking at where their ribs align to their pelvis. She is ribs on. I call it ribs on hip, right? So she, they're overlapping. They're significantly malaligned, and this is her best effort at standing. As she, as she tries to stand and walk, you watch her walk down the hall. She just crumples uh, as she goes. And right in, it looks pretty stuck. When I just look at it, it looks like it's a, a pretty stiff curve there. But you get a supine film and look at that. So supine is starting to come out already, just laying her down, taking gravity weight. Look at the distance between her ribs and that, and that pelvis now. Now I know we kind of have her do side bending. It's even better. Put her through surgery, just positioning her, releasing the bone, not a whole lot. We get her get her uh, coronally pulled in really pretty nicely. Now the goal is not a straight spine when we're talking about deformity, but if you're correcting the curve, you want it as straight as you, as you get it. Um, so it looks like a pretty big deformity. Uh, with flexibility, it becomes some small posterior releases. That's, that's not such a bad day in the OR. Uh, this lady looks a little different, leaning the other way. Um, again, Ribs on hip, a little more focal. She doesn't have the, the thoracic deformity that the other, the other patient had, but again, significantly imbalanced, a lot of radicular pain in the concavity, which is what draws, drives these people to surgery a lot of the time. Uh, supine, not as flexible, right? So you can see that curve still there. Her ribs are still kind of stuck down here. Uh, a little more work still comes around though. It, it moves a little bit. Like I said, if, if it moves a little bit, then you start releasing things in the spine, put them under general anesthesia, give them some muscle relax and the things start to come around a little bit and, and we pull that that around and and uh, she's a little overcorrected in the lumbar spine. She's got a little what we call reciprocal change in the thoracic, but she hasn't junctioned. I, that was back when I used to, I was cement augmenting for a few years. Um, she's five years out from that now and, and actually looking uh, pretty good and has not had any junctional issues, but a little overcorrected for what I want to do to people today. So, yeah. I'm not, no. I'm, lig I'm ligament augmenting now. I'm putting Juan's shoelace in. No, no, so um, I, I like ligamentous augmentation better than cement augmentation. Ligamentous augmentation. Yeah, so I'm either either with a mercelene tape or with one of those bands to the uninstrumented level above, UIV plus one. Shoelaces, shoelaces. To the midline, you should. Yeah. So, so do people know what?
Tyler's talking about. So I'm not sure what, what was the term you just used. I call it ligamentous augmentation. Ligamentous basically, augmentation. Basically, you take your shoelaces and you type it up and you make a couple of eight of figures above your instrumentation, and that one actually is working good. Yeah. It is working, and there's some finite element data that it's that it's working. Yeah. So essentially, the so I think I think other people are calling it distributed loading, um, or a soft landing, or a soft landing. Yeah, right. Or ligamentous augmentation. I kind of, I kind of like that, and uh, and and it's to guard against proximal junctional failure slash po proximal junctional kyphosis. Proximal junctional failure being proximal junctional kyphosis that culminates in something bad. But proximal junctional failure is, in my humble opinion, the number one challenge of the spinal deformity surgeon yeah. in 2017, and we're still searching for the answers and. Tyler, like many other of our colleagues across the country, went through this flawed phase of thinking that cement augmentation was going to be a protection. Mm -hmm. And people were cement augmenting the upper instrumented vertebra. They were doing UIV plus one. There are some people doing UIV plus two. And no one has ever been able to uh, correlate that with, with actual benefit long term. Mm -hmm. This ligamentous augmentation or distributed loading is the is the intervention du jour, and we are still waiting for the long term results on it. However, proximal junctional failure is most commonly an early failure, mm -hmm. not a late failure. So we actually don't need five year data to understand whether distributed loading or ligamentous augmentation is working. We need more like one year data or six month data because the the majority of these things happen actually very quickly. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. So, you know, the, the, there's different ways that these things fail. So cement augmentation, because a lot of times it's the, the UIV that has a compression fracture as a part of that. So you'd cement augment it, trying to reduce that a little bit. And I think it, I think it probably did a little, it, it, uh, it, I was never an add a level kind of guy cause that was just adding more, uh, more intervention. Um, and it was easy to do down a screw track, but, uh, it didn't always prevent failure. You just change it. So you'd get more of a failure at the next segment up, or you'd get a little ligamentous failure or something like that. So, so the ligamentous augmentation that I call it is, um, I do it relatively simply. I either am tethering to my implants or to the, the native bones where I'm going and getting the spinous process above, driving it through. There are devices that you can do that, that I'm, I'm using one now where you can actually tension it down and to your construct. Some people tie it to a cross link and you'll see some actually have a cross link on it where you tie it to the cross link and you just, just distract it down a little bit till it gets a little bit of tension on it. All that's designed to do is, is transition that force from the really stiff instrumented spine to the now mobile spine. And there's some finite element data that shows that it, it does that a little bit, but but again, it depends on how much you can do. Some people will, will go and figure eight through the next two segments or other things. I don't think any of that's working. Some people go around TP, some people do sublaminar bands. There's a variety of, of things. If you're not using the thing that isn't available to the general public yet, which I was trying to use for the first, I, I finally am able to yeah. get my hands on. So I haven't actually tested it yet in people. Yeah. But um, uh, are you using Merceline tape Marceline or what? Tape, yeah. Merceline tape. So they make Merceline tape comes in two sizes. There's like a 12 inch size that if you do that and you're in there like trying to like instrument tie this little thing because it's too short to tie once it goes around there it's a pain in the butt they make a 36 inch one that's super long and you have all this and it's really nice so if you're going to use merceline see if they can get you the long one um interestingly merceline tape right it's like this uh ribbon type suture was i think first invented for like cervical cerclage so we're using like cervical cerclage stuff for the spine but um but it works um so Going on, here's another. This is a, an idiopathic curvature uh, in a Marfan's uh, patient who looks similar to those other ones. She's got a little more thoracolumbar junctional kyphosis, right? This is going to be a longer construct than that one I just showed you. But these are not all dissimilar in terms of coronal malalignments, right? They're all looking fairly similar. But this one, I layer down, I do benders, this thing doesn't budge. And when you get a CT scan, you can see it's got bridging osteophytes all through that, that main curvature. This one's stuck. And so I'm going to temper my enthusiasm for how hard I'm going to pull on this. Still comes out pretty nicely aligned, but you can see she's still rotated through here. But, but again, my goal isn't a straight spine. It's a balanced spine that nerves are decompressed. Spine is uh, well aligned and balanced, and she's stable and not going to progress anymore. Those are, those are the goal of, goals of that. And she does just as well as those other patients who have a little straighter spine. Uh,
and right, I would argue that going in and doing some more aggressive osteotomy or something else is unnecessary in this because you get a good result with, with this little residual curve. So when we are thinking about our goals of surgery, coronal is easy. You want them balanced. When they stand up, you want them to stand up straight looking at them from the front. Uh, so your C7 <coughs> plumb line and your center sacral vertical line should be as close as possible. People tend to tolerate a couple of centimeters off one way or the other, uh, as long as they're a little bit shifted to the side. If they're within their SI joints, people function really pretty well. If you leave them tipped off with a shoulder up, they're not gonna be happy with that cosmetically, but a little bit off in the coronal plane is, is relatively well tolerated. Sagittal is, right, the goals are pretty similar. They've always been, you hear them all the time. So SVA, less than five centimeters. I always tell people I am shooting for the upper limit of normal. I do not want zero. I want that two to four range on young people that, you know, four to six range in, in older patients. Uh, PI minus LL of uh, plus or minus 10 degrees. I'm usually, if, if my pelvic incidence is, is, you know, 60, I want my lumbar lordosis to be 50. Right, I don't want 70, right? So we talk about plus or minus, I always want it to be on the short side of that. I'm not trying to correct them. Overcorrection leads to junctional kyphosis. Leaving them undercorrected and imbalanced also does, but getting them back into the balanced range in the lower sort of range of, of what is normal is, is what, what I attempt to do for most people. Uh, and pelvic tilt under 20, so they're not having to compensate. So here's a nice film that I show a lot because it's easy to measure. So this is a lady that, uh, has a um, old Harrington rod construct. So she's got an old school. So she's got a flat back deformity. She's kind of stuck that way. So when a spine is stuck, it's easy to calculate what you need. So when I start measuring things, I check my SVA, which is right terrible. Um, you see the little red line I just that just popped in here at the bottom of the sacrum here. So to the femoral heads, the vertical that gives me my pelvic incidence. So 58 degrees. We're going to call that measure that to the vertical, uh, I'm gonna get a pelvic tilt of 35 degrees. And then if I look and I say, hey, I'm gonna do a PSO for her, this is where I want her spine to be. If I do the PSO here, I can calculate that. That's sort of the old Andra trig formula that was published a long time ago by my group. Uh, and that's 35 degrees. So if I give her 35 degrees of correction there, I will bring this line to this line and she will stand up. But she's still gonna have a pelvic tilt that's 35. So she's gonna be compensated to do that. So what will she do? She'll let the compensation go and lean back over. That's what, that's what people do. So you have to calculate for that. So if I want to get my pelvic tilt less than 20, I add another 15 to that. That gives me 50 degrees of correction. And the way I, that's how I, that's how I would calculate this. That's exactly how I, I do it. Um, but then I double check myself. So I say, well, what's your pelvic incidence? It's 58 degrees. What's your lumbar lordosis? It's zero. If I give her 50 degrees of correction, am I going to be within that plus or minus nine or 10? Yeah, I am. So that's going to get her back to balance from that standpoint too. I'm going to be happy with that. Uh, I know I can't do a 50 degree PSO and she's stuck. So I did a stage one A-lift. You can see here, got 20 degrees of correction with an A-lift and then a stage two 30 degree PSO and she balances out really nicely. Um, and you can see this is our immediate post-op CT. You can see that big hyperlordotic uh, disc space here with a 20 degree A-lift. You can see the PSO and I like to close it down bone on bone. So if you look at this big, thick, old adolescent idiopathic fusion mass, look, at, it looks like it's fused, right? I mean, she got this big bridging bone here. That's not, I just cut through that, but I, I left enough bone to get bone on bone and those, those heal uh, really well. So we're starting, we have to, right? I'm assessing flexibility and nuance, but we're having to assess what are we gonna do? How do we get this to, to move to where we want to, there's all kinds of techniques. We use compression distraction, cantilever bending, our sort of workhorses of what we do. Translation maneuvers and adult deformity is, is really useful. Uh, segmental adjustment, rod contouring, rod rotation, and then apical derotation are all sort of the menu of, of forces you can apply to your, your implants. So, but before we do that, we have to get appropriate fixation. So screws, screws are your strongest implants. They're your best. That's what we use in this day and age. Can't always get them, but they're a key. So hooks and wires or sublaminar bands are, are options that you need to have in your tool bag uh, if you need to pull that in, if you're going to do a deformity. So getting screws isn't always easy. If you look at this person here, significantly rotated, and look at that pedicle. So it's rotated. It's at the apex of this curve. I want a screw there to be able to pull that, that in there. Getting that screw in is, is not always easy. Uh, this is that screw going in that patient. And if you look at the rotation, Sorry for the quality of the video, but uh, if you look at the angle that my hand is at putting that screw in, that looks crazy, right? You have to assume, right? 
the rotation there. You have to be able to sort of assess at each segment where you are. And so putting that screw in uh, at that angle, if I'm not confident of, of where I am and what I'm doing is, is a little nerve wracking, right? That's going in freehand, I'm not flooring or nabbing or anything else there. And right, look at that, that pedicle that, that's going. But if you, to be able to do adult deformer, you need to be able to get those screws in and get those screws in efficiently uh, to do that. Otherwise it's gonna take you a long, long time. You get a good fixation, you pull it around and it, and it looks pretty good. So what if you miss, what do you do? Uh, multiple options, so you can retry the same trajectory. So if you if you broke it laterally, no big deal. Get back in the pedicle, do it immediately. If you broke immediately, you be a little careful. You gotta make sure you're not going back in that, that same same zone. So you can retry your same trajectory. You can switch your trajectory. So if you put in a straightforward thoracic screw, try an anatomic trajectory, something else. Everything you do gets a little weaker. Quite honestly, if, right, our, our, if we're putting a screw and somebody misses, I'll probably retry it same trajectory once. If that doesn't really go easily, I ask myself, how badly do I need the screw? Most likely, I'm just gonna leave it out and move on to the next one. Um, you can put a hook there, you can put a wire in there, you can cement augment things. Those are all options, but but it's usually this or this for me in, in all reality. If I really need it, then I'm gonna work hard to get the fixation point there. So, all right, screws seem like they're hard, but they're not the hard part of, of scoliosis. So once we get there, we need to apply some forces and get this thing to correct. So. Um, and some of that is understanding where your axis of rotation. You heard about it yesterday, the instantaneous axis of rotation. So we're usually trying to bring people back in the sagittal plane, adding lordosis, reducing kyphosis. So that's usually shortening the posterior column. You can lengthen the anterior column, which you do in things like ACRs and everything else, but you have to, those are focally applied techniques that you have to be careful and cautious with because over distraction is always, is always bad. So you have to be careful of how you, how you do that. But that's, that's the only instance, right? Anterior lumbar is where you're actually lengthening the anterior column, not really a thoracic uh, technique. Um, and usually the axis of rotation resides in that posterior aspect of the vertebral body. Um, so if you, like this is a uh, anterior, like lanky five type curve correction. So if you put that in on the convexity and compress it down, it makes your coronal alignment better, but you're adding kyphosis. So you have to be aware of what you're doing uh, there. So this is sort of the work horse, horse of adult deformity. This is a posterior column osteotomy, some Peterson, Ponte, whatever you want to call them, we'll call them PCOs. Uh, multiple segments done, taking a kyphosis and harmoniously just cutting through and then closing by compression. Those osteotomies uh, gets you a correction of kyphosis. So that is a resection of interspinous ligaments, inferior portion of lamina, inferior facet, the top of the superior facet, if you were at my lab station yesterday, we talked about that a lot, and then the ligamentum flavum at each segment to make sure that that opens up. And you don't oftentimes have to do many of these to start to get things to mobilize. So once you do that, you can do compression distraction, that's sort of self-explanatory. Uh, you can make your own IAR. So the posterior column osteotomies are using the patient's inherent IAR. Uh, this is making your own. So a PSO is essentially putting the, the uh, focal point right at the front cortex. Um, it just, it's really nice for significant correction at a single level. What's not nice is for rod breakage and pseudoarthrosis and all sorts of other things. So, so it works well in a previously fused spine. I always say if it's not been previously fused, I'm generally extraordinarily rarely that I would ever do a PSO. Um, that is laminectomy, complete facetectomy, completely removing the pedicle. I see a lot of people come to me for revision stuff that had a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. They got a lot of pedicle in there, so I don't know how it worked out, but. It's also known as fraud. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, there's a. And then we come back and, and place a pedicle screw <laughs> the, <laughs> at the level of the pedicle <laughs> subtraction <laughs> osteotomy. You, you see that, there's a, there's a lot of pedicle. Most frequent pose. <laughs> yeah, not uncommon, just wait. Um, uh, it's a wedge resection of the vertebral body, you remove the lateral wall, and then finally the posterior vertebral body wall. Those are ordered in the order you should do them. Posterior vertebral body wall comes last. Again, at my table yesterday I was talking about it, but those epidural vessels bleed once you take that posterior body wall. So you have to have everything else done before you take that so you can close it because they don't really stop until you close that osteotomy. So an extended PSO is essentially PSO plus the disc above. Oftentimes you put a little cage or bone graft to pivot on in there. Uh, vertebral column resection is, you said Dr. Mendel do a, do a thoracic vertebrectomy yesterday. That is not a VCR. We call it VCRs, but it's not. VCR is a correction term. So that is removing that same bone, but collapsing. You are shortening the spine in the VCR. In a corpectomy for tumor, trauma, something else, you are reconstructing the anterior column. If you're putting an expandable cage in, I'm going to argue it's not a VCR. Right? If you're expanding something in there, you're not doing a VCR. You're doing a corpectomy. Uh, a VCR is a shortening osteotomy. 
Um, right, what do you do in your VCRs, or maybe you're about to say it? But... Uh, so my VCR, I remove that entire segment. Uh, I close it halfway. I take a T-lift cage and put it in the front where it fits there kind of nicely, and I, then I close it the rest of the way. So I'm blocking the front from closing, but only partially. So right, I want the whole thing to come, like if it's kyphotic like this, I want it to be able to come down and then do this. All right, so I'm blocking the, the front a little bit, um, but not all the way. I'm not re If you just reconstruct what you just removed, you didn't change the alignment at all. VCR is an alignment changing operation. It's semantics, I know, but 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 there's a difference. Um, so translation maneuvers, these are really useful in adult degenerative scoliosis. It's, it's the workhorse of what I do. All companies now have these reduction towers that you can put on. You can take any screw. If you plan ahead, you can use reduction screws. If you don't want to decide later, you can pop these little reduction towers on. Uh, and again, it takes that, that patient, that's the maneuver I use. So I, I would put the, the first rod, anchor it down here, and then put reduction towers on and pull this around. And it's a trend, it's a coupled translation derotation because spine's like this and you're pulling it up and you're lifting it at the same time and it gives you a nice, uh, nice correction. Um, and again, that's pulling the spine to the rod. So you need strong implants to do this. Let's get through some of these. Um, let's see this. So this is an old video doing something similar. So if you look, I uh, don't want to do that. Um, it's fixed at the bottom, so the, bo the patient's butt is at the top of the screen there. Um, so it's fixated at the bottom. I've got a, a hook holder at the top there. That's what you see sticking up. That's clamped onto one of my screws just so the rod isn't going to be translated around there. And I've got the assistant holding a rod holder. So that spine's going to, I'm trying to hold it kind of in those upper implants. It's not connected there. It's just kind of loose. But we're going to put some of these uh, reduction towers on. And then as we reduce it, we're going to apply that load to multiple screws at the same time. And you can see sort of, um, reposition this a little bit. Sorry, it's a little long. I had a more edited version, but it wasn't embedding in the video or the thing very well. So, um, but as you see, what I want you to see is my left hand. See, I'm kind of holding those there. As I tighten that down, I'm going to be pushing that up. So. So those screws, I'm going to be derotating that spine a little bit as it comes over, and that's going to pull not only the spine over coronally, but it's going to, in the sagittal plane, bring it up a little bit and help derotate that a little bit and makes for nice correction. And, and it's kind of teased back and forth, like a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, just back and forth, each of those, each of those, each of those, uh, until it until it comes around, then you lock it down. So. After you do all of that and you think you don't have enough, you can do some in situ rod contouring, coronal, sagittal bending. Uh, usually in situ contouring after the rod's in is usually the coronal maneuver. I don't think, I think sagittally really stresses your screws. I don't do that uh, very often. I will sagittally bend a rod as it's going in, but not, not after it's in. Um, and cantilever correction is really the key. Cantilever is essentially, it's a fixed beam at one end and then you're gonna apply a, a force to it. So generally in adult deformity, you bend a lordotic rod lock it down at your sacrum and pelvis so you have a good distal fixation and push the rod down. That pushes that spine in, into lordosis uh, and then you just tighten set screws as you go. That, that can be really powerful. You need to be careful you don't overdo that sometimes. So you can do it in the coronal plane as well, um, but generally that, for me that's a sagittal plane correcting maneuver. Rod rotation essentially is the old control Dubuisse technique where you've got spine fixated, you bend in a rod that you put in like 90 degrees, so you put it in scoliotic and you're just get rod holes and rotate it into lordosis or kyphosis if it's thoracic. Uh, so you essentially turn the coronal plane into the sagittal plane of the rod. And then apical derotation is is hooking up the entire construct. It's an, it's an AIS maneuver, but it really gives you a nice chest wall reduction. It is coupling multiple screws in multiple segments uh, at multiple levels of spine and coupling both sides together. So it can be really powerful and you're not pulling out your screws. So things to think about, um, again, is this patient appropriate for surgery? You need to have solid indication before put anybody through this. I have a really long discussion with all patients going through this and I talk specifically about the stiffness they're gonna have from the surgery. I spend a lot of time on it, all the things that are gonna be different for them because it, it's life changing and you can never undo it. Um, so they need to have pain resistant to non-surgical techniques, uh, neurologic deficits due to that deformity where you need to correct that, or radiographic progression. That's pretty rare in adults as an indication for surgery. Is the patient medically and socially appropriate for the surgery? It takes a lot of healing time and a lot of, a lot of effort uh, from the patient and family to get, get through this, and they need to have a good network. Um, 
is their bone good enough? That is the biggest problem in this day and age. I get DEXA scans on everybody before any fusion operation. And I have, I have all these people kind of circling that are on Forteo or Prolia trying to build some bone density before we put them through the operation. They may have a big problem, but if their bone isn't strong enough to heal and hold, you are only going to make it worse by operating on them. As much as you want to help them, you put them through a big scoliosis operation, things start loosening or pulling out, they're not going to be better than where you started. Um, and they, do they understand what all of this means? That's, that's key. And do they understand the, the medical risks? So level selection, do you have to do the sacrum pelvis? Oftentimes in adult de degenerative scoliosis, you do, but that's a significant motion restrictor. Uh, how high do you need to go? So try not to stop at apexes of curves, try not to stop at junctions. Um, but again, there's, there's a lot there. So the, like T10 to ilium is a really common adult level or a T2 to four ish is the top stopping zones. Sort of the T7, T8 are kind of no man's land. I will go up to T9 if, if need be, but beyond that, I tend to go beyond. Um, what's your PJK prevention strategy? We talked about earlier. I'm ligamentous augmenting now. Uh, getting them alignment is key, but transitioning that force is, is what we're, we're looking at to do for that. So, um, and when do you say no on these? If you can't do it right, don't try and do like, like somebody really isn't a candidate for the right operation. Don't try something small. It doesn't work, right? You just dug a deeper hole. Do the right operation if, if you need to. Um, right? Everybody wants to help people and they're having problems and pain and all sorts of other things. But if you can't do it right, you're just going to make it worse and you're just going to be living the pain with them. Um, if the medical risk is too great to get them through the operation, it's not worth having a straight spine and a you know stroke or an MI or something that, that is other debilitating in a whole different way. Uh, beware of cardiac, pulmonary, renal, and, and renal and hepatic risks you got to be really careful with. Um, if you don't think the patient can get, if you can't do the operation, your institution can't do the operation as necessary, you got to pass that along. And if the patient's psychological state is not such that they're going to get through this well, you can do the greatest operation in the world and they will, you will not get a good outcome. So you have to be really careful with all that. So.